preseason, like the, 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 the non-conference game will start, it was hell. Like, I wanted to quit. I wanted to go home. <laughs> I, I was calling my parents, like, I don't think they're speaking English, mom, because some people are from Florida. Some people are from Kentucky. The, um, the accent is so different. There is, this is not English, mom. Like, I'm struggling so much. <laughs> Hello friends, I'm Silali and welcome to another episode of The Narrative Podcast. This podcast is about hanging out with your favorite African sports celebrities and personalities chatting about the game, the life, the unique experiences that have shaped them into who they are. We talk about anything and everything sports, but most of all, we have a really good time. Now this week, I'm joined by a lady who really seems to have done it all, from playing D1 basketball to opening her own academy, from becoming a culinary expert to building her own town. Today, I have the honor of learning more about all of this from Mani Nayamke. Mani, welcome to the Narrative Podcast. You are a busy woman. You just flew into France from uh, Côte d'Ivoire. Which one is home for you, France or Côte d'Ivoire? Man, I say both, but mostly Ivory Coast. Côte d'Ivoire is my home for sure. So at what point did you move from um, Côte d'Ivoire to France? Um, I was five going six years old when my parents and I moved here. And um, to be honest, it was I didn't really, really remember much of it. I was very young. Uh, I didn't know what was going on. I just knew that I went from having people looking like me and to be in this classroom where I was the only black person. So it was a big change. Wow. And I had to adapt. I had to adjust to many different uh, culture um, in France and Africa. So obviously it was tough. But I'm glad that um, I learned through the process. I'm glad that uh, my parents uh, brought me here. And yes, it was a huge experience. And I'm so happy to, um, to be who I am today. And thank God because... I never gave up, and that was that was that was an adventure for sure. Yes, yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine. Now, um, you were this amazing basketball player from an extremely uh, young age, uh, meaning your talent was identified at a young age. But how did you get introduced to the game? When did you realize that okay, you know what, I can be a superstar? Um. Well, I'm, I'm going to be completely honest with you. I don't come from a family that, that, that are in sports. Like, nobody in my family played sports besides my dad. He played soccer at a, at a very high level in, in Africa. But nobody else in my family was into basketball. So when I got in France, I was um, especially in Rouen, in uh, Haute Normandie, it's another region near Paris. And um, it, was, it was pretty much a challenge because I got challenged from six years old and every day was a challenge for me. It was like I had to, I had to get through the steps of like making sure I can adapt, I can, I, can be the, uh, I can be that person. So basketball came around when I was just staying home, um, just reading books. Uh, I was homeschooling and just one day uh, I wanted to actually try something and I tried handball. And handball is very popular here in France. And from doing handball for a year or something, and my coach had to leave, and I got left with a bunch of girls that were actually also doing basketball. But I was very short. I was, I'm still short, but I was short back then. And everybody was telling me, there's no way you're going to be able to make it playing basketball. You don't even have the, the height. I was very, very skinny. So it, it became a challenge. Yeah. It became a challenge at the moment where I was challenged by everyone and I'm like, listen, listen, you know, let me, let me, let me try this to see, to see if that's something I can do. I never had a passion for basketball ever, ever. It was just, it came out of it like uh, the things that happened to me in France. I had to learn new way to live, and I had to learn to get to new people in their culture. So basketball came around where like everybody was playing basketball. Let me try. And after a year of trying, I made it to the let's say like the AAU team that were gonna play for the nationals in their region. So after a year, I made it to that team. I still didn't understand 
the rules, what's going on. I just know that were taking me here to there. Uh, you getting better. You got to go here. You got to talk. Like, I'm like, okay, I guess. Like, let, let, let's move on. And from that point, yeah. I made it to the, um, let's say, AAU under under 13, under 14 team for the national team, like for the French national team. And that's where I started, like, um, meeting different people, like girls that were actually passionate about basketball. Their parents were coming to the games. Um, it was just like a whole different world. I'm like, I went from playing in my neighbor with girls that were actually playing basketball for a very long time, like were born playing basketball. And I came to another, another different level where the girls are passionate and they're actually really good. I'm like, I need to step up. There's no way, there's no way, way, way. There's no way I'm staying this level. I gotta get better. So yeah. I, started, I started practicing on my own. I started like watching uh, videos of Don Stanley and all these Olympics players back then. I started learning the culture of basketball on my own because nobody around me knew the challenge of myself. Like I, I wanted to get to the next level. Nobody understood what it's like for me to be the only person from Ivory Coast and everybody's French, everybody's passionate, everybody's have somebody that's supporting them. I was by myself. So I had to learn more. I had to get to know myself and what I'm capable of doing. And I was young. So all these things got me very mature in my head because I was just taking challenges, challenges. And I made it to the national team. I was 15 and I was the younger player to play Euro League, Euro Cup in France when I turned 16. So that's how I started pretty much. Yeah, yeah, wow, okay. Um, and you say, you, you, say you, you, you don't have sports in your family, but I did stalk you a little bit on Instagram. I saw you, I saw you with a six pack, you know, I, that, the, the, your abs popping out. I see the athleticism. We'll, we'll say it's genetics. Maybe there's not sports in the family, but you definitely have the sports gene through the family. Um, and uh, I mean, kudos to you, because because you you first of all, you're telling me that a lot of the basketball you learned was self-taught, you know, and you actually going out there and studying videos and um, understanding the game, taking that initiative by yourself. Um, and then you are playing at the highest uh, junior levels of basketball in Europe. I mean, mm -hmm. you, I think you, you were, you got um, under 16 or under 18 silver for the EuroLeague, for the youth. You played in the Youth Olympic Games. Oh, wow. You, you did your research. <laughs> yeah, I did, I did my, I did my research. Listen, Manny, I want you to flex on them. I want you to, you to tell them where you've come from and what, what, you know, what accomplishments that you've achieved. Wow. Okay. <laughs> this is crazy. <laughs> wow. I never, I never really <laughs> talked about this because, you know, I'm a very, very, very humble person and I come from, like, uh, humble beginnings. My families, we are very, like, spiritual people, but, like, we understand that each step, each world that comes into your life, you have to, like, beat everything and then get to the next level. So I didn't know everything. Everything that you just researched, I didn't know it was going to be this way. This is God plans for me to just take the, the route of like getting to the highest level of basketball. So each steps, I got challenged by everyone, every single woman, mm. every coach. And I always felt like I, will, I will always felt like I was misunderstood from the beginning because I could never relate to anybody that were in my shoes, understanding, living another country, coming here and then learning basically from, from scratch. You know, and um, right. so, yeah, made it to the national team. I was 15. Let's say if it was the under 18, I was always like a year or two years younger. I was with the generation of the 90, 90, 91, 92, and I'm a 93. So I was always the youngest. I was always the rookie. I was always, what is she doing here? Like, why they got her on our level when she's young? Like, it was... I was never accepted, Let, let's put it like that, never accepted by the group of the girls or the generation because I wasn't a part of the crew. I wasn't a part of, uh, we've been knowing this girl. We, I just came out of nowhere, honestly. And, right, right. And I love challenges because, like, my dad is an agriculture uh, and he harvests organic fruits 
and he came from nothing to be who he is now. And my mom is also, she's also in the education system. So education, agriculture, nutrition, um, spiritual, it's, it's, it's all basics in my family. So when you, come, you start something, you have to finish it. Even if you, even you're not passionate, the, what you're looking for at the end, you, you, you have to go, to, you have to go through the steps. You can just quit. So I'm like, okay, this is it. This is basketball. Let's see what it's like to be in the national team. Um, wh what's the goals? Like, who we're gonna play against? So, European Championship happened, and you have to play against different players, and they're like the best of their the countries. So I'm like, you gotta right. step up, money. You, can't, like, you represent France, but at the same time, you represent all your people, your family, every coast. And I understood yeah. that from at the early age because I was obviously understanding I was the only one doing that. And the steps have been it was it was complicated because I went from being I'm I'm always I always was very athletic. Like you said, my genes, I have great genes. My dad, my family, my mom's side, like we we have great genes and I don't have to do much to gain muscles. I didn't have to I didn't have to, like, uh, how do you call it, uh, lift weights. Um, I was just naturally athletic, super super fast. You know, I had that in me. So I used all these natural genes, genetics, to just get to the next level and then add that with everything that I was watching on videos from, like, the shooting and the, the dribbling, the passing, understanding the game because I'm very, like, into details. So I was watching games, watching games, watching games, watching games. And from that point, I was moving forward. Like, coaches were putting me on this team. They were putting me on that team. Uh, I was doing two national, two European national teams in one summer. Um, and I was coming back uh, with my AAU team, playing the, the whole year, playing with the uh, professional team. Like, I was playing for seven to nine years. It was nonstop basketball, basketball. And I learned through wow. the best. And when I got to yeah. 16 years old, uh, I was playing at this team called Montville in, uh, in, in, in uh, like the east, like west of France. It's a professional team. Uh, they had an AAU team, a prep team. So when you're good, you can actually like start and play with a professional team. So that's how like me and a couple of other girls I'm actually doing the basketball academy with, that's how we met. So we clicked naturally because right. we were like the hustlers. We were like the uh, the under the underdogs, like nobody, everybody underestimated us. So we became very very close, and we won the championship that year. And me and her and other girls got like upgraded to play with the professional team. And w when we got to play with the professional team, it's a new world. Like you gotta understand, we you like uh, maybe getting a high school, high school diploma during the year. You're missing classes because you're playing your league because that team was playing your league at the time. So you still don't understand this is the highest level in Europe. You just, you, you know, you, you came, you're coming from, a, you know, playing with the young girls and young team. And then out of nowhere, the point guard got, away, got, got hurt. And then I got like, money, you're going to be playing with the professional team. That was like my first professional game. It was against Galatasaray. And then uh, mm -hmm. Simon Augustus was playing on that team back then. And I was watching film of her and different many, like, uh, professional players. So when I saw her on the team, because I wasn't doing, like, a shoot around with the team because I was still with a young team. I just came that night. You're going to be on the bench. You're going to be playing. So it blew my mind. Like, I was just scared on the bench. Like, I hope they're not going to put me in. This is the highest yeah. level. I'm young, like, whoo, this is going to be crazy. So I was, I was still paying attention, but I was, like, sitting at the bench with, like, the trainers and, like, talking to them, like, do you know who that is? Like, oh, my gosh, she's really good. So at some point, the coach turned around, he's like, money, go. I, th I think my whole body <laughs> froze because <laughs> I didn't move. And then everybody was screaming, yes, you go. And then I got in. I'm like, just. Just, just God, help me. I can't mess up this. Okay. Yeah. Got in. The point guard, our point guard was Tamika Johnson. She was on the at WNBA. She got drafted also. Very, very talented point guard. Like, she was one of my mentors that year. She's the one who was telling me, like, 
you know, you're talented and you're very smart. Like, you got to use that. Like, we, we come at, like, the same size. She's very strong, too. So she was guiding me, helping me the whole way, like, during my 16, 17 years when I was uh, playing with her. And then when I got in, she was just yeah. looking at me like, just do you. And at that moment, it was just like, you're passing me the ball, I'm shooting because uh, I'm not going to do too much crazy things. I'm just, I'm open, I'm shooting, I'm passing. <laughs> So it just, that's how I got, like, my best game on, on that day. And then I started, like, get more confident. And then I'm like, oh, damn, like, I can actually play at that level. This is good. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. I had a great time. I had a great time on that game. And then from that point, every game with the professional team, I was traveling with them. I was everywhere with them. Um, I learned through her. I learned through the team. I learned through the yearly games. And on that year, she was explaining to me what it's like to be um, a, a student athlete. Because in France, we were student athletes, but it wasn't like in college, in the U.S. So it was from her, I understood that like, maybe because I wanted to learn so much more about basketball, so maybe I need to get there. I need to go learn more because I started like I was 12, 13, um, not much of basketball history before. So I understood. she explained it to me what college is and like, well, she went to LSU. So I'm like, okay, I did my research, talked to my parents about it. And obviously you gotta understand back then, nobody wanted no French players to leave France and go to play college basketball. It wasn't common. Hmm. No coaches wasn't gonna allow us to leave the country like that. So I did all of this in secrets. I talked to her, I talked to my parents. I'm like, you know, y'all want, y'all always wanted me to have my degrees, get to the highest le- level of education, and in college, in the U.S., you have to do both. You have to be at the highest level, and you have also got to get your best grade and degree, your GPA high. So it works just perfect for me because in France we don't have that. If you miss classes. They're not gonna get you like they're not gonna get tell you you can't play or you can't practice. It just don't matter like that. But the the way the system was really? set up <coughs> in the US, oh yeah, what? Back then you you couldn't like it just if you were somebody that wanted to get your degree or your high school diploma or your whole family was supporting you, then you would maybe tell the coaches, I don't I don't want to be in that game, I don't want to travel with that team because I have schoolwork, and still. They're going to look at you like you don't understand the opportunity that you're missing. So I had to, uh, I had to balance, adapt, hide things so I could like finish my, di- my high school diploma and at the same time play at the highest level. And then the same year with the national team, we had the world championship in France under 17. And it was in France, in Toulouse, in the south of France. And that's what the first time, like, I saw Duke, University of Lovo, North Carolina, uh, Minnesota. It was a bunch of coaches with their shirt and their, like, their school name on it. That was our first time seeing this because I was at the World yeah. Championship. Obviously, it was many different teams there. So for us French girls with um, background from Africa, we never been recruited before by anybody. For us, we stay in France. We play professionally in France. Uh, you, you at the highest level in France. Like, nobody was telling us, leave the country. Nobody. And I got to the point where, like, I'm looking at Tamika Johnson. She obviously already had, like, some, some sort of, uh, like, a license because she's been through college. Uh, she's been at the highest level in France. She, she's getting paid, like, crazy paid. Uh, everybody respect her. Most Americans that were coming to France playing got the highest uh, salary or, like, they were the best players. So I'm like, if all of them went to college and came back to, and came to France to play in our level, I need to go there. So when I came back to France, yeah. I can be considered as one of the top players and also gain as much salary they're getting because we were young. We were not, we were not getting any money at the time. So for me, right. it was like, let me go to the route. Let me learn. Let me not skip steps. Because obviously I started so late and there's so much I needed to learn and understand. And I did not speak no English at all. I learned in a month when I got to college. So let's let's make a short. I mean, like, you know, 
like, like you, in fact, you're, you're, you're touching on, on my next question for, for you because I was going to be like, all right, so you ex- extremely talented at the youth level, uh, amazing that you were able to identify that, okay, you know what, I need to, to get to that next level. I need to go to the States, um, get into college, and then see where that takes me. So you're recruited to the University of uh, Louisville, playing at the highest level. This is D1 ball, right? So this is this yes. is the the highest of the high. Um, what was that experience like for you? And the reason I'm at, I'm very intentional about asking this question because it's going to tie into La Baz and your inspira- inspiration of why you created that academy. But I want to know, like you've just said, you you didn't speak English. So what is it like? You're leaving home, your kid. You know, by the time you're getting into college, you're still very much a kid. You're, you're either 18 or under. So you're leaving home. You're going across a huge ocean to another <coughs> continent. You're, you're trying to learn English. You're adjusting to a new culture. You're so far away from home. It's clear that you're very close to your parents. Um, and that was, that was back in the days when social media was not like that. I don't even think WhatsApp had even been nope. like created. Right. So yes. it's not like you can just pick up your phone and be like, Hey mom, let's do a video call and, you know, and, and get in touch. But what was that like being, um, an international student going to a D one school where it has very high, uh, I know what it's like. Um, you know, for me, the school I went to was D three. But even still, the pressure to excel in your academics and on the court was very high. So what was that like for you? What was the culture shock like? Um, And how did you adjust? Um, I mean, you know, like when I was I was telling you early, like everything from six years old was a challenge. So I like challenges at that point. All my life and going there, I know it was going to be one of my biggest challenges to learn the, the language, the culture, the level. Uh, you know, like in college, it's different from playing your cup or your league in France. So I had to be, I had to be a new person, a new, like uh, adapt to a new culture. I love that challenge, like, because I started very young in it. So I wasn't afraid. It's, if there's one thing, about me leaving my friends, the national team, everything that I built here. Like I was actually like getting like recognition, recognition in France because I made it through the steps and I'm living there to be nobody in the US. And I like that. I like started from the beginning, like and started over again. And yes, so I'm a point guard, as you know, and there's no way you can get to a D1 school. Even you were on the national team, you were the top players in Europe, won many like distinctions. You starting from the beginning, learn the basics, which is learn English. Yeah. How am I able to communicate mm-hmm. with my teammates or the coaches on the court if I don't understand? Like so, the first preseason, the first months, like August before actually preseason, like the the the, the, the non conference game will start. It was hell. Like I wanted to quit. I wanted to go home. I, went, I, I was calling my parents like, I don't think they're speaking English, mom, because some people are from Florida. Some people are from Kentucky. The, um, the accent is so different. There is, this is not English, mom. Like, I'm struggling so much. I, I'm like, what's going on? I, I, I thought I was like, I wanted, to, I wanted to leave. The first two weeks, yeah. it was tough. And then my mom was like, the same challenges, same, same things. If you don't get through this, you will not get to any level anywhere in your life because you, you're ready to quit. So public speaking class, I went to see the principal, my, my advisor. I'm like, put me in all communication classes, measuring communication, languages. I'm good with languages um, back home. So put me, in that, put me in that scenario. Put me in a, in a place where I'm going to struggle so I can get to the next level. So public speaking, you got to stand up speaking in front of everybody and you don't know no English. So I had to prepare myself the day before because I knew I was going to speak in yeah. front of people. So that got me understanding their accents and where they're from and how they speak. And oh, wh- why do they say this like that? And so that class helped me. So when I was going to practice, the little things that coaches were saying, hale, hale, like giving the ball and like, let's, like I got to like get in my head. After a month, 
I was good. I'm like, oh, I understand now. Like, y'all, y'all won't play me anymore. Like, I know a what, month? This, what this means, what this means. So I was ready. So, yeah. A month. Yeah, it took me a month. Okay. Can you hear me still? Yes, I can. That's like some superhero abilities right there to learn uh, in a month. Like, I think languages must definitely be your thing because uh, I, I, I left Kenya when I was really young, like when I was six years old, and I came back about um, maybe 10, 11, 12 years ago. And I kid you not, it took me like 10 years to feel comfortable with Swahili. And you're talking about a month? Money. What? <laughs> oh, wow. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't, I don't, like, how am I, like, I going to say that? Um, you know, when you, you, you wanted to break barriers, uh, language barriers and culture barriers, it's so many barriers that uh when you 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 cross one you don't even think that like it's huge you like oh god there's another one now coming on so stay focused so i was just staying the course to focus on the next steps so i wasn't even realizing anything that i was doing it was wow because i was so focused 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 because right. i saw how like if your gpa go down or if you miss this class or if you don't play well on that game, it's everything changes. Coaches won't play you. Uh, the whole mentality. And I'm an international student. Let's start there. Like, international student athletes, I'm fighting. I've been fighting for them back then. I'm, I'm still fighting for them because we had it like the worst. And right, if I can right. write a book or a documentary to have all international students about, like, even my story about how, like, to get to the, those hurdles and not make the mistakes that we made, I would do it because there is like mm-hmm. a, there is like a, I, I, I didn't want to speak about this, but that, that, that subject gets me all the time because I have, that's how I created a buzz. So you asked that question, it came from all of my struggles. I'm like, how come somebody from Europe, and I'm not even speaking just on me, how come somebody who went through big challenges, barriers, I mean, everything that was, stopping her from being great she beat that and in europe national team world championship she even gave recognition as like one of the top point girls how come she gets to college and people girls players there are not known of no one maybe ranks because we're in the u.s they haven't done what you've done in europe how come they play in front of you how come they accept them to make a lot of mistakes on the court and you on the corner. How come the fact that you don't speak the language as a barrier, the fact that you're African, how come all of those things are something that, like, maybe she's naive, maybe she's not smart enough, maybe she's too slow. Like, all of those things, I was sitting just watching, like, yeah, I know I'm not stupid, right? Like, you guys know that I understand, like, everything. Because if you understand two or three different languages and you get to a country and then you speak like a broken English. It doesn't mean you're stupid. It just means that you're learning somebody's culture, like you're trying to adapt to their culture so much because you're already ahead of Facts. yours. So there's no way somebody that is learning a new uh, uh, language is like naive or stupid because of the broken English. So the way that we were seen by the Americans and how we were used, man, that was the things that like hurt me the most because... That's another type of, I say, discrimination. Maybe it's the, maybe not, not that word, but it was at the time for me. And I'm speaking on, my, on myself, and I know a lot of international players, especially the one coming from Africa, living, you know what it's like home, back home in our, in our motherland, living there to come there. You're trying to, like, get somewhere to help your, your people, and then you're putting in a case where your family ain't there to defend you, Nobody's here to support you. Like, she's a great basketball player. She's talented. Like, she needs to play. Like, we support. There's no one for you like this. 
a lot of players there, their families are there because you are, you have to understand the U.S. culture, the American basketball culture. They are passionate, passionate about the sports. So their families, the fan, the city, everybody goes to the game. And you come in that culture, you have no one supporting you. And then you understand this is not a game. These people are taking it serious, but you also taking it's it life. serious for yourself. But you have, yeah, it's right. life, but nobody support you. So that came at that moment. I was thinking about a way, if there's a way we can create something to help international students feel like people are supporting them, but still stay focused on the class, on the class, on the classes, the courses, the basketball games, and focus on what a student like is supposed to focus on. And everything else as part of like, um, uh, uh, get your, uh, visa, uh, a bank account or, uh, a, a, a new number, like all of those things that nobody's going to help you for it. If I can find a team and place that around these kids so we can take them from Africa, get them to college. So we happen to manage this, all of, all of those things so they can focus on just basketball and, and school and nobody going to stop them. That's when I started like writing things down. I'm like, let me let me think through all of this this big this this project that I'm trying to create because I felt so alone at that time. You know, um, you've touched on something so 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 important, and I feel like we're not talking about it enough. And I think that's why for me I was so impressed with uh, La Baz Academy because I was reading up on it, you know, doing my research. Um, and you had mentioned that no one talks about the, the, the mental, the social, the, like outside of the sport, how challenging it is for an African student to come from Africa to go to America. And like you're talking and like I even feel like emotional because it's reminding me of my own experience. You know, at, like when I was in high school, I was in Senegal. I was living in Senegal, my family was living in Senegal at the time, so we, um, my parents were still there, and then I moved mm-hmm. um, to the States by myself. So I'm going to this school, um, I didn't even oh, know wow. the protocol, I mean that was, that was way back in 2005, so I, don't even, I didn't even know the protocol of applying for a basketball team, right? So for me, I'm just like, you know what, I can hoop, I'm a good player, I'm going to show up, I'm going to show them what I can do, and they better give me a slot. But I get there, mm-hmm. and... Um, I know that I, I may not be the starting five, but I can be the start part of the starting seven. But because of my mm-hmm. lack of understanding, I was actually uh, redshirted the whole first season. So I didn't play a game. I'm suiting up. I'm going for practice sessions. I'm doing everything everyone else is doing. I'm putting in the work, but I didn't play a single basketball game the entire first season. You know. And that's, that was, and that does, it does so much to your mental because, like you said, where you've come from, you're a superstar. You're turning heads. You, you know what you're capable of, but you're not getting the airtime. On top of that, you're away from family. Um, thankfully, the college I went to had a really good international student program. So they did help with, you know, opening bank accounts um, and getting phone numbers. But, like, I feel like our... We're similar in personalities in that we are go-getters and we can figure Definitely. things out along the way, right? Mm-hmm. But not everyone has that yes. personality. There are some people who can't, they don't know. They don't know where to begin. There are people who are introverts. There are people who, they, they don't know how to express themselves, you know? And what about those kids? Like you said, people think they're dumb and they're not dumb. They just don't know what to do because they've not been shown that. And then you, even like you mentioning, um, you know, at games, like I remember, man, like games, everyone's parents would come, you know? Yeah. After, after the game, they're going, they're talking to their parents. Their parents have brought them food from home. And you're just there, mm-hmm. you know? You, you, you got your girls on the side. They're giving you high fives. And, and, and that's really how I was able to make really good friends with the international community because they became my family. My parents mm-hmm. came for one game, and that was my, and that was my senior game. And it was a stretch for them. So it was so important for me that they were there. Um, but it was a huge mm-hmm. stretch. You know, it was a huge thing. But yet everyone else, all the other team members, because I was the only black girl on my team at that time. Everyone else mm-hmm. has family around wow. them. And no one talks about it money. No one talks about it. And that's why I'm so impressed with uh, La Baz. 
and like I want us to now shift conversation to to your academy. You've said you know the inspiration behind the academy. Um, I'm seeing uh, some of your players, k- kids at Long Beach. Um, I've seen you've had interactions with I think her name is Leticia Ami Harris. She plays for South Carolina. You know, um, and just mm-hmm. what you're doing with these kids, it's so so uh, commendable. So I mean, I, I know because I've done the research, but tell us about La Baz. Um, tell us where it's based. Tell us what you guys do. Okay, um, La Baz. La Baz means the basics. So that's what my family taught me when my mom created um, elementary school in back in Africa in 2009. So the goal back then was I'm, I'm learning everything from my mom and my dad. My, they're like my mentors, the people I'm so, like, so proud of. Like, they're strict to me being away from them through my college years, national team years. So the fact that they weren't here physically, but they exchanged through letters, Skype back then. So that happening really much. And so I'm always learning from what they're doing. And my parents are always trying not to help the next person. You got to put yourself in somebody's shoes before helping your own self. So they're like givers, giving, giving. So my mom created an elementary school just like in a like poorest neighborhood in Kumasi, in Abidjan. So we can help our community. So that's how my parents think. Let's create, create let's build a school Let's have all these kids going for like paying half the price because their family can't afford it so we can give the best education to them. That's how my mom was thinking. My dad also trying to like, let's do like have a community where we can give them fruits, uh, pineapples, like harvest and then give it to them so they can sell something. So we, we help us. We help our community. That's who we are. So I see my mom is in the education system. My dad is into agriculture and I'm into sport. So I'm like, at some point, I wanted to go back, learn from the school, and bring my culture, like everything I learned from the sports uh, 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 atmosphere, from colleges, from friends, from national team. I wanted to bring it back home because that's something that is missing. And I was the only French Ivorian in Lovo by then. So I'm like, there's so much more. There's so much people. So I went back. <coughs> the first years, um, I came just to help the school, like, brought, like, a books so they can have, like, reading sections and, like, learn English because I learned, well, I learned for a month. Like, not a lot of people can learn this quick. So I wanted to make sure, like, everybody's different. Everybody learn a different way. Some will take longer. But if we can start when they're, like, in elementary school, it will be better for them if they get an opportunity to get to college. So I'm thinking, like, let's go back. Let's go back to the younger. So when I get to Africa's, I talk to my girls. We play on the national team. I'm still like, girl, like, I have my people. Got, we got land. My mom got a school. There's something we can do. Like, let's, let's, let's do a basketball game. And that, that, we are in, like, our career. Like, we, we play professional. We are on a national team. So that summer, I said, I'm not playing on a national team this summer. I got better things to do. I'm not saying, like, this is not the time. But my head is somewhere else. So because of what I went through in college and most of them didn't leave. They were in France. They were in the comfort zone. So I, I went back there and I saw girls huh, taller than me, so smart in school, but nobody's doing anything to help them achieve the student artist career, basically. So we created camp. Let's listen. We did not have anything. It was shirts, whatever we can bring for our sponsors, from our team, getting shoes yeah. here and there. We brought everything. We like let's let's start a camp. And my in my neighbor, people know my family, who they are and how like they help so many people. The word went around that like his daughter trying to do a basketball camp. For we wanted to do just 20, 25 kids. It was forty six kids. Through. We got came through <laughs> and we didn't have much equipment for them. And the kids that you see that's funny. The kids that you see in Long Beach, oh, it's, it's 17 of them. And each one of them have wow. his path, how he's getting better. How, so all of them were at the first camp. It, we, were started, we were thinking about doing a girls camp, focus on women, help girls get to the next level. We saw, we saw little kids over there shooting and they're like watching us. Like, you guys are women. You guys can coach. You guys are basketball. So like, 
we played against them. We like we can ball like we so because I'd never <laughs> seen this before. So yeah. they came to our camp and we made the girls and boys camp. And we on the side like, yo, like these kids are really good. Like we gotta do something yeah. about it. And it, it like it got me. It got me in my head. Like, there's no way I'm living here, going back to my professional life, playing playing games and doing my masters. And these kids are back to their like routines of struggles. So I wasn't sleeping anymore. I saw the talents. I was like recording everything. I'm like, girls, like, yeah, yeah, take care of the basketball part. I'm taking care of the mental part. I need to speak to those kids. So I started like get to know them. Like, what is basketball to you? Like, the way they were already thinking about like basketball as a passion to them, and I hadn't had it before because me it was a challenge. And I see kids that are like passionate. But they're going through so much in their like daily life that like nobody believed they can make it out of like just basketball and school, obviously. Like I take it personal. I took it that at that time I took it personal for all of them. Went back to my professional team. I was playing in Lyon, France, in the south of uh, in the south of France. The team is called Las Ver. It's a uh, Tony Parker own team. And at that time, Marina Malkovic, the head coach of Serbia national team. She was my coach there. She's the one who brought me from Lovo to, uh, uh, to, to, to France to play professional again. So she was my mentor. She still is. I was explaining to her, like, you know, like, it's like five, six people in my head, and I want to do so many things. Like, there's kids in Africa, in my hometown, I got to help. I can't focus 100% on being a just a professional basketball player. There's so much more I can do, and I'm stuck here just playing basketball, win games or lose, but, like, you go home to nothing. Like, like I saw some difference, so I told her like, I might quit. I had to let her know that like I wanted to do something different. She supported me, hundred percent. Like wow. she said, take the time and do what you can do through distance, and when you're ready, do it. She was the only one who knew. So I talked to the kids, I talked to their parents. I'm like, this is what we, this was gonna happen. To make it there, we gotta find scholarships. Like the steps that I went through. That was so hard because nobody was helping me. I was doing the same thing. So I sent videos to the coaches that I knew. I'm like, this is what they're doing now. They're like super smart. And I had my master's in interpretation and uh, English and like um, immigration. So I was doing the translating of uh, um, transcripts, um, doing the paperwork visa. Like I was doing it all, like all of it because nobody was there to help us. And I knew what, what right. it takes to leave Africa, to get to France, from France to get to the U.S. I knew it because my whole life was getting here to here to here to here. So the kids were talented. I said, listen, now we're going to be a family. Y'all got to see me as a big sister. But at the same time, we got to be loyal to each other because we are not going to be, you're not going to be where you think you're going to be in a year or two. It's going to take us some tough times, some tough routes. But if you trust me and I trust you guys, then we're going to be like praying and be loyal to each other because at the end of the day, you want to live your, 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 your dream, which is being a student athlete and play at the highest level and make it hopefully to the NBA or to the EU League or make it somewhere. But I wanted to make sure like they understand the, the, the meaning behind having two choices. In Africa, we don't get much of two choices. You can't get your degree. You can't get, you can't get your doctorate in Africa sometimes. And you won't even get the job you deserve and the salary that you deserve because of the government issues that it's nobody's fault. It's just the system is just so broken. So I'm like telling them, even though you're smart, and even though you can get your degree, get to a point where basketball will take you somewhere. Your school is going to be paid for. You're going to play at the highest level. And at the same time, you're going to end up having your degree and play at the highest. You're going to be able to choose. If you want to continue in your school uh, uh, business or if you wanted to be a professional basketball player, you're going to choose. You're going to have choices that you never had before. So stay on the course. We got to stay focused. It's not in a year. It might take four to five years, but it, that's what it took right. for me. The kids understood that. Once some didn't understand, they learned the hard way and they understood. So either way, they knew that like it's not something that happened overnight. So I created a buzz. Mm -hmm. Because I wanted them to learn the basics of life, like the step, the, the things that everybody skip. Now we're gonna go back to the basics. So 
So you're not skipping steps here. If there's something you're not good at, learn the ways to get there, but don't don't think that you're gonna it's gonna happen overnight. So I call it a Baz Academy because it was it was an academy, but I haven't created at that time. I was in the point of do, just doing basketball camps. And from doing basketball camps, and I was able to help those kids, I started doing the paperwork with the people that I met there that were like becoming a team. And I, I created like the, the, the actual academy, like register with the paperwork and all of those things. So I became, like, I became to be seen in Africa as somebody who takes people's coaches, players, for money and sh- ship them and sell them. I'm like, this, they didn't know me. They don't understand. Or you got to understand also, like, I wasn't playing in Africa. I never played on the Ivorian national team. So me going back and doing all of this, I'm nobody. So for them, it's like, mm. who she thinks she is? She's taking players and sending them there. I said, I talked to them. I talked to their parents. I even talked to them first so we can all work together. And as you know, in, Af- in Africa, People that are older than us, they don't, they won't listen that a woman will tell them what to do. They, they don't, they don't even want change at that point. So I started focus just on my family, what we can do with the school, the kids' family, and them. If the parents give the gate to, like the go to, to do something, we do it because the right. parents are with us to help the kids get to the next level. We started listening to their family and just the family and the kids, not the coaches, not the people around that want to get money out of them and blah, 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 blah. Like, we will focus on them. So, and I told the people back then, like, this is because they want to have a better education. That's one. And the scholarships, let's be honest, even in France, nobody can afford to pay 40000 each semester just to get an education. In France and Africa, nobody can afford. It's given to them because they're great basketball players. We got to use that. Right. So... I stopped explaining myself. I was focusing on helping them. I quit my career, went to Canada, Toronto. I had different talents then, back then. So I was doing different things. I was putting money on the side with my, my parents, my family, my siblings. We were doing visa paperwork. And the system is just so complicated and so tricked on, on so many things. It took us at least six to seven months for the kids to have the visa to get to Canada and from Canada to get to the U.S. So now today people are saying like, oh, like they like we want, I, I can't even put in words the things that we went through for us to be where we are today. And I'm so proud of them because they're still humble. Like they're so hungry. Right. The hustlers, they're like, we understand what you meant by that. Like we are like, we are not, we are not just happy with this. Like we're going to get further and further and further. And like, if you can help, our uh, young, younger brothers and sisters, we're going to do it. Like, I didn't have to do that. They did that themselves. They understood, and they did that. Like, they passed it around, passed it around. And we will focus on making sure, like, NCAA, clean house. You have to have your GPA right. Uh, your your trust can send it away. Uh, all the things that they don't know of and that I knew, I was doing all of this, so they were going to be eligible to play D1. So anybody that wanted to give them money, that wanted to make sign, what, what type of... No, you understand nothing. You want to play NCAA games. Like, you can't sign mm. or somebody get in your head. So that was a constant fight for five years. Having this... We're in the sports business and we're in a men's world and we are female, we are black, we are African... We are underestimated, undervalued every day. Like, it's nothing new. But I wanted to ask you, though, um, you are doing so much for these kids. And then I know you've been able to develop a system that now works. So now that you know, okay, if it's a kid coming from Ivory Coast, going to Canada, this is the document- documentation that they need. But I'm curious to know, what, is some, um, what are some of the important knowledge and skills that you guys at La Baz teach the kids to make their transition to the West easier? Um, well, first thing is um, accepting your struggles. That's hard on, on each level, but like accepting that you are coming from a humble beginnings, you don't have it all, it's okay. That's, that's, that's the first thing, because they're gonna get to a place where people have it all family, money, clothes, and just accepting that it's okay and it's a part of who you are, it's a part of your journey to accept yourself. 
mentally, that was my first rule. Once you're able to accept yourself, accept your struggles, accept that it's going to be hard and you mentally prepare for this, I don't, I don't see, I don't see when anybody's going to get in your head or like all of those things stops. If a kid is mentally aware of his abilities, uh, his flaws, uh, his people around and that he has a support system, nobody can stop him for achieving his dream. So that's my first thing. Any camp, anything that we're doing through since 2016 until now, I always take care of the mental part of everything. Because if you have the biggest challenge and somehow some some of the players you're gonna see, we've seen it many times. Oh my gosh, he's so talented. But mentally, he's just all over the place. He's not like disciplined. Right. Like all of those things happen so many times where you see somebody supposed to have this career, <coughs> but don't make it even there because mentally all of his is messed up. So I went back to the roots of the basics of here. Once you focus here, we can get now to each, each, each steps of the world, like the things that you have to learn to get where you need to get. So first thing is the mental aspects of everything, accepting yourself. Some of the kids are Muslims, some are Christians, some are Catholic. Um, we don't discriminate whatever religion that you have or culture that you have or don't have. But as long as you spiritually understand that, you have to be loyal and trust the people that God put in your life. Not because they want to take advantage of you, but just to teach you because they feel like people don't spend their time teaching you things. If you understand that, then it's easy for me to give. And as much as it's easy for them to receive and understand that like, it's a giving relationship where everybody's winning Hello? and there is no like money involved, no like, uh, uh, oh, you're going to have to give me this after because I, give, I did this for you. No, nobody's expecting anything Hello? out of nobody. We did this out of, our, out of the kindness of our hearts. We wanted to help back the community, so it's no money involved. And in some some points, I told them, I already done my career. <laughs> I'm already leave, like we already born. Like I already done what I was supposed to be doing. If I'm here, it's because I was I felt alone, and I don't want you guys to feel alone. It's something that it should be like talked about, supported. Your family should be around. Go to your uh, uh, graduation. So out of my heart, that I wanted to do this. So once I understood that, like if they get to the NBA or get uh, a bad, the great job they always wanted to have. I don't even, I'm not even looking for anything. Like I keep saying this and I want, I'm going to keep saying this. If the kids don't give back to the community, it's on them. That means all of this that you learn through us, you're not passing it around because you're selfish. That's on you. But I'm not going to force you to do something you're not willing to do naturally. So for me, it was just giving and, you know, and we'll see where it goes. So because at this point today, I'm focusing on something else that was going to help us have a bigger academy, bigger hello, space hello. so everybody can gain more things in it, you know. So I'm glad that like right now they're where they need to be at and focusing on it.